I'm Sarah, and this video is on how to become a guru in three easy steps. First of all, what is a guru? In my world, it's anybody that people look up to. The fact is that we focus better on people than we focus on movements. We tend to seem to need somebody that we can have as a face in front of us. So presidents rather than systems for governments, historical figures rather than movements, Rosa Parks, MLK. And it works the same for communities and movements. Think of any community that you're part of. When you think of the community, are there certain people that pop to mind? Or movements that you care about? We're wired to follow other human beings. So we get gurus because our minds want to simplify things. A person is too complex to take in. And if the person is a representation for the idea, we're only seeing them as that representation anyways. It doesn't make a ton of sense for us to know everything about MLK's life and, you know, who he was married to and what his relationship with his children were like and, you know, what he was like growing up. Historians like this stuff, but most of us know the I have a dream speech and what MLK stood for. So you don't always get a choice about whether or not to become a guru. You can choose potentially to become one. It's harder to choose not to become one if you're a natural leader. So the next video is going to be about how do you use power ethically and uh, how do you not get kind of hanged as a guru. But if you want to become a guru, here's the life cycle that I think I've discovered for it. First of all, Find someone else that you want to follow. We work off of examples, like I said. So you need another person with an idea, or you need an idea to follow, some sort of fodder to get you started. As you start following this person or idea, you get to rule two, or step two, which is realize that you can't. The difference in gurus, I think, is that we look at other people and we might try to be like them and then we realize that there's a part of them that we can't emulate like an example is one of my teachers uh, in a practice called circling he's unbelievable at like noticing things in people and just calling them out like uh, wow it seems like people in your company don't trust you what's that like for you I thought for a very long time that I had to be able to do this if I was going to be good at the practices that we do. And I just couldn't. To me, it felt mean. Um, and I couldn't, I, it was like I noticed sometimes things like that, but speaking them felt way too scary. And if I did, I would blow myself out. I would be like trembling and uncertain and unable to stay in connection with the other person and I would lose the whole connection. So, you know, I had this guru that was able to do these amazing things and I couldn't. Now, I think this is the place where you get the difference between someone who's going to become a guru and someone who isn't. There are other aspects that we'll talk about. But one person says, okay, I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to make sure that I can do this right. I'm going to study for years. And they might become a guru of their own right, but in the same tradition. For me, I said, okay, it would take me years to learn that. So what am I good at? Another thing often about gurus is that if they don't have an unbelievably spectacular idea, oftentimes they're charismatic personalities. And so I already had people that were interested in what I was doing because I was doing it differently and because I'm relatively charismatic, despite the fact that I would most of the time rather stay in and read than lead people. So I said, okay, what is it that I do well? And the thing I do well is care about people and love people, which cliche as it sounds is actually a superpower in some regards because I can make people feel at home and wanted and like they belong pretty instantly. But I can't do it by pointing out the way that they're being. It's, that's a very young move, it's specific. I do it by noticing and appreciating the wholeness of who they are. Like, wow, it really seems like you care about the people in this room. Or you seem uncomfortable, and I wonder if you feel like we understand you or like we welcome you. We're noticing people that are being left out and inviting them in. 
So it's noticing and pointing things out, but in a different way. And that was step two, was realizing I couldn't do it, and then going to step three of finding my own way. And if you find your own way powerfully enough, then other people start to follow. My friend Brian Robertson is a great example of this. He um, has a system called Holacracy, and he was a CEO at a, a software company. And he realized that the traditional way of running a company wasn't really working for him, despite the fact that he was massively successful at it. So he could have, you know, done a whole change reorganization or, you know, found a new CEO or done what most companies do. But he looked at the precepts and he said, OK, like, what is it that would be ideal to happen in the system needs to happen? And what am I good at? And he's very good at systems theory and he's very good at personality models. Um, and so he formed this new management system, Holacracy, that distributes power equally across an organization. And now he's a guru to a lot of people. Becoming a guru usually takes time. You have to notice what's wrong and be in it long enough that it hurts. You have to actually feel the pain enough to decide to do something different. And then you have to develop something different. People don't always come when you've done that, especially if you've done it in isolation. But if you've done it in connection to other people, if you've shared your process along the way, if you've involved other people in making decisions, more likely than not, you'll become a guru.